The Master starts on April 6th, my birthday. So what are we doing? We're bringing in and celebrating that with PGA Tour champ Jordan Spieth. He's been there. He's done that. Not for a long time, though, 2015. Can he get back and can he do it? And we have NFL draft prospect. We love getting to know these young guys that are going to change the complexion of the league. It is Clemson linebacker Trenton Simpson on the show. NFL League meetings, the fallout, the Aaron Rodgers, the update on Lamar. All now. Not too shabby, to be awesome, awesome uh, to be honest here. Jordan Spieth on the show, Clemson linebacker Trenton Simpson, who's like really elusive and strong and incredible and dominant, and I cannot wait to get to know him on the show today. I was going to bring in Maya to do the cold open, but we had some creative differences <laughs> after yesterday's show. So she will not be making an appearance, maybe ever again, on this program. We've got a lot to talk about, so we're gonna jump right into it with two incredible guests with the NFL's annual league meeting gave us plenty of info yesterday, and it has officially been 24 hours since we were landing the tweets from Lamar Jackson as he made his trade request public. Now we heard from John Harbaugh as all the reporters in the universe surrounded him like sharks yesterday, and he made it clear he wants Lamar as his quarterback going forward. Now, it seems like the front office is on the same page. Team president Sasha Brown met with reporters last night and said this, quote, we love Lamar, we're committed to getting something done. Nice, clean, simple, covers their bases. Listen, the Ravens hold all the cards here. They can match any offer that he gets while under this non-exclusive franchise tag, but if this relationship is past the point of repair, at some point it would be healthier for both sides to move on. And I think the Ravens, they have to do everything they can to try to repair things. They gotta come out, throw some flowers, send some caviar, add a receiver. You see what the Jets are doing to try to get Aaron Rodgers to go on McAfee and say, I want this trade to be done. And they have to go all the way and say, we did everything we can. We saw it with Debo Samuel back when the Niners, uh, you know, they came back from a bleak situation between the two of them and you rebound, you get it done. But if Lamar does not want to play there, if he doesn't want to be there and it wouldn't help uh, anything to sort of drag it out into some holdout situation, you gotta let go. And if the Ravens change their tune and try to grant Lamar a trade request, we learned yesterday through uh, a, a star-studded game of telephone that he does potentially have a place that he'd be okay going. Robert Kraft said Meek Mill texted him a few days ago saying Lamar Jackson wanted to come over to the Patriots. Kraft said it was Belichick's decision. So apparently Meek Mill texted Kraft saying Lamar Jackson texted him and said he wants to come to the Patriots. Keep following all along. So some might say, and some might be me, that Lamar is, is reaching out to people to get connections to NFL owners. Uh, and that would lead me to think, does he really want to go there or is he not getting interest and now friends of friends are trying to hook him up with where he might want to be able to go? I don't know, but it makes a lot of sense that New England would be a top choice. If you, you know, have to think long and hard about it, if you're Belichick because you have Mac and you don't want to create any impossible, uncomfortable situation for him, and you look at Lamar if you're Belichick and you say, yeah, this is a special and a proven player. This is an MVP and the offense has been lacking. If you're in, New in England's war room ahead of the draft and here in free agency, like they're outside the top 20 in every major category nearly. And dead zone, not red zone, literally last in red zone offense. So Lamar would instantly light a fire to this thing. And Bill O'Brien would totally t help him take it to the next level, right? So I, I think because of the way things ended in Houston, people forget that he, Bill, Bill O'Brien I'm talking about, is one of the most innovative offensive minds in the game. We talked about it yesterday when we were talking about this, but O'Brien transformed the Texans offense when he got Deshaun Watson to take advantage of what Watson was good at, at can do. And that's when everybody said, you can't run spread or college concepts in the NFL, it won't work. Let's not forget Bill O'Brien was the first one to do that and make it work on a consistent level in this National Football League. Let's also not forget that Lamar is just 26. He just turned 26 years old. That's just about a year, a little over a year, older than Mac. He is still ascending as a passer. You get him with the right coordinator in the right system, and I'm chef's kissing gifts all over the place, okay? I think the Patriots go from being 
projected to finish last, as they should right now in the AFC East, to a team that legitimately enters the chat in the entire AFC. They're right in the muck of it. So that's going on. And then we still have this Aaron Rodgers thing and that was very inter intertwined with the league meetings as well, the owner meetings. Uh, you know, because we heard from both sides of the, the guys, the top dogs who are making these negotiations happen. Let's hear what Jets general manager Joe Douglas had to say first. You know, there's been some some productive conversations, and um, you know, obviously we're uh, we're not where we need to be yet, and um, you know, we're, but uh, feel like we're in a good place. Do you have a deadline on when you want to have something done? Yeah, I would say uh, there's no hard deadline, and um, you know. There's not uh, a ton of urgency um, from our, our standpoint right now, but, um, you know, still, uh, still very optimistic. I'm sort of imagining the, uh, like, week before you go out there, you're laying in bed at night and you go, I know I'm going to get asked about this, so what should I say? And he delivered it really well. No deadline. Not, not a lot of ton of urgency. That is a rehearsed, well-landed line. They're still very optimistic about what's going on. These are the words and the disposition of a gentleman who feels he is in complete control of the situation, and he might be. Both sides have a bit of leverage. I've maintained that all along. I still think that that's true. It's all going to come down to timing and who folds first. Aaron has made it clear he wants to play there. The Jets are saying, listen, we'll take him off the Packers' hands. He does not want to play there. Packers still have leverage in the fact, and they of course want something for their four-time MVP, but they have to get make the deal. They have to make the trade, okay? They have to agree. So, uh, and by the way, if it all falls through, they have an answer at the quarterback spot. It's their disgruntled MVP quarterback will come back and then they've got another problem with, they have a different problem. They're loaded at quarterback if this doesn't happen or falls through in any way. Whereas the Jets, they would really be on the outside looking in. It's who has the luxury of waiting as long as they need to? Not much of a learning curve for Rodgers. You could say that, you know, with the Jets. But deals can fall apart. Who is in an impossibly brutal situation at quarterback? That's the Jets, not the Packers. So Joe Douglas does have leverage, but that there's still a part of that. That is true, and that's what's so nitty-gritty about this. Now, to ease, you know, fans of the Jets, let's remember, his coordinator is Nathaniel Hackett. You are allowed that Joe Douglas disposition of patience that you're seeing here because this is running the same offense that Aaron ran in Green Bay. And I'm sure it's going to be chock full of Austin Powers references that will fly over my head because I've never seen the movie. We're going to see a little bit much of the same here. Those two have a lot of chemistry. They work well together. They'll be able to, those two hit the ground running immediately. That said, if you're expecting to win the Super Bowl, Aaron, which you are, and everyone's saying the Jets are here, the Jets are here, in that AFC East, can you really... Uh, can you really take a lot of time to build chemistry with your receivers? Can you really say Garrett Wilson, all these guys? Like, he needs to be the guy right at the beginning as soon as he can. You know, granted, they're not doing anything right now, but come May, when these workouts are... You're seeing Tom Brady post thirst traps this morning. He's working out with old receivers. He's not even in the league anymore. They're just have, these guys want to get together and have a little bit of cohesion here. Uh, so, yes, the Jets can take maybe a little bit more sweet time, and it's only because the Packers, they need help in the draft. They want to get some picks this year with players that can help right away, and that's exactly what GM Brian Gutekunst is saying. Is there any scenario that you'd be comfortable making a trade without getting a first-round pick back? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, it's, it's, uh, that's not a necessity, but at the same time, um, you know, the value of the player is, is he's a premier player, you know, so I think getting premier picks back for that is or players is, uh, is important. Do you have to have picks this year or would you be willing to wait till you know future drafts? I think as soon as the better the better I think certainly if we get beyond the draft and everything changes compensation changes and, and, and then you know so that would be a whole different scenario but hopefully we can get this done soon. It's so fun to think about like they go to get their their bagel or their like cornflakes and they pick up their lanyards. Like, is Joe Douglas is right near Brian Gutekunst? Like, do they see each other? Do they acknowledge each other? What is that vibe like? It's so fascinating to me. But also just what he's saying, it's the first time there's really been an acknowledgement that there might not be a first-round pick on the other end of this for the Green Bay Packers. And their fans need to know that. They own the team. They need to be ready to brace yourselves for it. And you can't really slam Goody if that's what ends up happening. He made it pretty clear 
that they're, that's probably the most likely reason that it is dragging out. He is fighting. Goody is fighting right now to get this team the best possible value and return in really what's been an impossible situation. And it's nearly impossible to do that when you don't completely control said situation. So it's going to be a wild game of chicken here. We're headed towards the draft. It might come down to how dug in can you be if you're the Packers versus the Jet side. Uh, it's going to be wild to see, along with the Jordan Love pick, of course. Like the, These things are going to define what Gouda Kunst was and is in the National Football League, and especially in Green Bay, to the heart of that fan base. So I don't think we see him bend super easy because it means something for how he is viewed and what he's able to accomplish. That being said, this has got to get done in the next three weeks right before the draft. No first rounder for the Packers is my estimate right now. I don't know if he's able to get it from them because the Jets have a little bit more leverage because of the time frame and that 2023 heavily, quickly approaching draft. All right, last thing here. We got to talk a little Niners because I was joking all along, Kyle and John Lynch love the nebulous, you know, tug of quarterbacks. Who's it going to be? What's it going to be? But there was some clarity that was a bit unexpected from the Niners on the situation with Brock Purdy. Uh, and with Trey Lance, both coming back from serious injuries, of course, and the fact that neither guy is particularly a huge sample size to evaluate. I expected Kyle to sort of, sort of say, I'm going to keep it close to the best. I don't know what's going on with both quarterbacks, but John spilled the beans. I think Brock has earned the right with the way he played, that he's probably the leader in the clubhouse at that. You know, I'll let Kyle make those kind of decisions, but I know when we talk, I think Brock's probably earned that right to be the, be the guy. If we were to line up, he'd probably take that first snap and... Okay, so in thinking about this and in talking to Hamilton yesterday, the more I thought about it, the more I loved Lynch's decision to make it clear which way they're leaning at quarterback, okay? I've heard how much the guys in the locker room believe and rally around Brock, and I think there's something to be said for having everyone on the same page about who they're going to battle with going forward. And I do think we saw enough out of Brock last year to say that he has earned it. And yes, Trey Lance might have the crazy upside and he might be able to do a little bit more than Brock, but here's a little reminder of who the NFL's most efficient passers were last year. And spare me the talk about Kyle Shanahan's system as a way of trying to tear him down, okay? Yes, and I see Jimmy G and I see Tua and they're on the full screen as well and they run the same system, but that is irrelevant. What is relevant is that Purdy showed a mastery of the offense as a freaking rookie, people. What's relevant is the fact that he played well enough to lead them to an, NA, to an NFC Championship game and possibly beyond that if he didn't get hurt. And what's relevant is that he's running the show better than any of the other six quarterbacks Kyle Shanahan's used over the six years in San Francisco. It also doesn't hurt that he's under contract for the next three years while accounting for, let me do the math, 0.4%. 0.4% of the Niners' cap space. That means that if Brock keeps playing like this, or at some level near this, he could fall off a little bit, I don't even care. He not only gives the Niners the caliber of quarterback they've been searching for year in, year out, quarterback, revolving door, rotation, competition, whatever drama, he also gives them one that they can build around for the next three seasons and keep this absurdly talented, crazy mega talent roster intact. Let me break it down for you. Brock is making one-tenth of what Lance is this season. The same is true for next season. Why is that relevant? Nick Bosa is entering the last year of his deal. Brandon Ayuk and others, they want to get paid as well. And if the Niners eventually feel comfortable enough with Brock to trade Lance, that would save them almost $10 million in cap space. Your girl came with the math this morning. It's true. This could be a difference maker when it comes to bringing those guys in long term and being competitive for a long time. So while I know Niners fans have some saltiness, Rob Guerrero, I'm talking to you stats, you know, seeing the way things play out, seeing the picks, everything it took to move up and grab Trey Lance. But if you found your franchise quarterback going forward in the midst of this, especially when it's going to set you up well for the future, it doesn't really matter. If you date the person for 10 years, and waste their time, but you end up at, you know, at um, an event and meet their ex-best friend and you fall in love with them, you wouldn't have met him without the situation. Life had its course, it went the way it needed to go, and they might have landed themselves their future. I appreciate the clarity 
from John, and I appreciate the clarity from Kyle Shannon. We have a huge show today. We got the Masters kicking off on my birthday. This is Kismet. I'm going to sit on my couch and watch, and we're going to talk about it with PGA Tour Chef Jordan Spieth joining the show. All right, first guest today, a 13-time winner on the PGA Tour, a three-time major champion, and is just over a week away from attempting to win his second green jacket at the Masters. Born and raised Texas Longhorn and Dallas Cowboy fan, our friend Jordan Spieth. Good morning. Morning. I want you to win a Masters jacket so bad, and we're going to get into it. I'm very excited. I know things are going very well for you, but before we dig into any of that, the Texas Longhorns, John Rothstein, who like runs things over at CBS, like he's this crazy mind. He goes, okay, throw in with Texas. That's the team for the tourney. And they did really well. They suffered a tough loss against Miami on Sunday night. Have you recovered? Did you think it was their year to win it all? Yeah, I, I had them. I have them every year that they're in the tournament winning it, but this was the first year I was really confident <laughs> about it. And Oh man, they had it too in the second half. And then Miami went on a great run. Um, they went to that forward that they have and he had a perfect game and, uh, for someone to have a perfect game and lose like that, you know, it was, it was tough. I mean, I was, you know, it looked good because then that Texas UConn matchup was going to almost feel like the national championship, right? I mean, UConn's got to be the yeah. team to beat right now. Uh, you're such a fan. I can tell you're like a little low about it. We're going to get, we're going to figure yeah. this out though. And, and <laughs> speak, who do you have to win it all now? I would think UConn, um, they look like the most complete team, but obviously that other side of the bracket there be pretty exciting with SDSU and FAU. I don't, I mean, I can't imagine there's any bracket that had three of the four teams, right? Um, nope. I haven't followed it closely, but just a wild, I mean, it's kind of the way it was in NCAA basketball this year, just a lot of craziness, right? So, um, not shocking that it happened again in the tournament. Yeah, I mean, you're saying you don't follow it, but it sounds like you follow it pretty closely. And I don't know who follow your Longhorns basketball and football. So let's dig into that because we had a, a, a big talk yesterday about B. John Robinson and how incredible he is and how we haven't seen a, a running back drafted in the top 20 since Saquon Barkley, and that was back in 2018. Do you think Bijan is the guy that's going to change that trend? You are a diehard Cowboys fan. Zeke was released. Should the Cowboys draft Robinson? It'd be amazing. I was seeing that he might go to a different NFC East team potentially, but you know, with so many quarterbacks projected in the top 10, I'm not sure it'll even get to running backs in the top 20, but man, he's, he's a, he's a playmaker. Um, it was a lot of fun to watch him, you know, wear the barn orange and, um, and really win us a lot of football games. So I, I think the running back position with his skill level is still, can be yeah. utilized significantly in, a, in the NFL. I mean, I feel like he'll improve catching passes and then he just, he's big, he's fast, he's shifty. Um, you know, Saquon was kind of a next level type talent, right? And I think Bijan could probably get there, but I don't know. I mean, I, if it's the Cowboys, we really need help on the cornerback and wide receiver position yes. with hopefully Pollard coming back well from his injury. So um, obviously I'd like it, but, uh, we need to take care of some other things. I think a little bit more. Is it going to be, well, you, you, hold on. There's a lot to unpack here. You won't <laughs> mention the other NFC East team name. <laughs> I can't remember who it was. I thought I saw that it was, yeah, oh. <laughs> it's the Eagles. <laughs> it was the Eagles, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, I couldn't remember if it was the commanders or Eagles, but if it was the Eagles, that's. I mean, they got a pretty good one already there. So that's why I was stumped a little bit. It's not because I don't want to say the Eagles name. It's <laughs> yeah, that's most. I, no, I, I, I thought that was it. I was like, how hardcore of a fan are you? But you're right. The Cowboys <laughs> yeah. have lots of needs. Their defense is definitely one of them. OK, we've got a huge couple of weeks coming up uh, for you. You've got the Masters. OK, April 6th. It all kicks off. How are you feeling about where your game is right now? I feel good. I just played a four week stretch and played some really solid golf, had a couple chances to win tournaments and kind of figured out what weapons I had, which ones I need to go work on. And you know, I've been very familiar and comfortable at Augusta national. And I feel as complete a player going in there as I felt in, you know, a number of years. So it's more, there's going to be a lot of different storylines and drama surrounding the masters this year. And so I almost feel like I can fly under the radar, which is, an unusual spot for me at that hmm. tournament and um, maybe just go in and go about my business and see if I can work my way into contention there. 
I love that, and you have a secret weapon. I mean, you're saying you're playing okay. You played really well, it was like two weeks ago, and it came down to the very end, and you didn't get to hoist the trophy. You did get to hoist this little fella that I think might have an impact on your master's game. Jordan, tell me, how has being a dad changed your life, your approach to golf? This is the cutest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, he's he's kind of got that drunken walk going right now. It's just hilarious. You just kind of <laughs> sit back and wait for him to fall. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, look, it's just, uh, it's the best. I'm absolutely enjoying it. I, you know, when I'm on the golf course, I'm nothing really feels like it's changed, but off the course, everything's changed. So um, moments like that are really cool and, you know, limit the blow a little bit when you don't get the job done. But I think it'd be even sweeter if you did it on the 18th green sometime, you know? Yeah, that would be pretty great. I'd like to see that. Uh, is it true that you've traded in private jets for an RV? Is that true? <laughs> Um, we, we are traveling in an RV this year, but, um, a lot of the time I do meet the RV there, um, via a plane, but, um, in Got the Florida it. swing, we rode on it. Yeah. in the Florida swing, we rode on it, um, you know, between tournaments and we'll continue to do that when it gets to be above like four or five hours, it, uh, seems a little nicer to save that time and fly. I was picturing you like full full Christmas vacation, whole family yeah. in. You're driving, you're pulling up, you're 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 stopping at the quick trip for some combos and funyuns. No, that's not really it. Yeah, some Slurpees, some jorts, a nice uh, Miller Lite <laughs> in my hand. Once we get the awnings out, yeah, um, I can't say that hasn't happened, but it's not as common as you there might you imagine. You take the private jet to the RV. I don't know that that's a combo that I see very often. So that's really, that's unique to you. And I hope it, uh, it works well for you with the Masters. So the, when, I, when I think of that term, it, it, tournament, it's a little bit, you know, it's like the Super Bowl here in, in my world in the NFL. And you won back in 2015. When I look at NFL players like an Aaron Rodgers, it's in my sport, such a huge thing to get the second ring, to be in the Ben Roethlisberger, Eli Manning conversation. And when I look at golf, and I didn't know this till this morning, there are only 17 golfers in history to win multiple masters, as I'm sure that you know, the Tiger Woods, the Jack Nicklauses of them all. How important is it to you to get that second one? Um, I mean, it's my favorite tournament. I think of it as the Super Bowl as well, just as, as you're saying. Um, it's always been my favorite tournament. It was always a goal of mine to win. And then I've had a couple of close calls and not pulled it off. And it's more that I just want to get one back for those more than anything else than to be the 18th two time. You know, I didn't know that stat. Um, it's just that I want to win every single time I tee that up. And if that ends up being two, one, two or seven, you know, um, the point is, is I'm going in to try and peak for that week every single year. And um, I've had a, a, quite a few um, chances on the weekend and in our sport, you know, it's not one-on-one. -on -one, so um, you got to beat a lot of really good players and fortunately been able to do that once there. But, um, you know, I'm kind of itching and hungry to have that opportunity again to feel like I can close another one out and, um, and kind of, you know, my, I've been working really hard the last few years. I've seen a lot of positive trends in my game, but this is kind of the most complete I've felt in a while. Um, and so you kind of need that there because you're going to need every shot. You're going to need touch. You're going to need, you know, pretty much every facet of the game around Augusta national. So, um, it's nice to feel that kind of confidence and feel like I'm trying to maintain and fine tune things versus trying to find something. And, um, scary. it would, it would be, it would be extremely special. Yeah. Um, it would, it would be, I, I, I would only wonder what it would feel like compared to the first time. What do you think? Oh, so if you take yourself back to that first time, 2015, what's the moment, like that feeling that's sort of driving this master's experience for this year? Like, what do you think about and to carry from you from 2015? It's a long time ago. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I remember what it was like to, I mean, I held the lead each round. So I remember what it was like to sleep on that. Um, given it was a dream of mine and I had finished second the year before. Um, so I kind of just had a lot of, I had a lot of things going right, but I also needed to control, um, you know, my emotions at night and just kind of get away from it and then just wake up and mm. be like, all right, it's time to just play another round and sleeping on those leads is, um, you know, it's a challenge, uh, and it doesn't necessarily get easier with time. Um, I just think the more often you find yourself in contention 
the more comfortable it gets in a kind of near period of time. So I'm happy to have done that in the last month or so. That's more than I could say the last couple of years coming in. And um, it kind of makes that, I remember that being my biggest challenge was just getting sleep and getting myself away from the tournament when the round was over and not thinking about it. And um, I feel like I'm better poised to do that now if the case. And, uh, you know, I, I remember the walk up 18, obviously. I mean, I had a four shot lead or three shot, four shot lead. And I, was, I just had a chip shot to get up and down. So I knew it was essentially done. I wasn't going to wear it on my face until it was done. But, you know, inside I was like, holy, holy shit, you know, this is going to happen. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, you know, for, for it being your dream going out on a practice screen with your friends and hitting putts to win the masters, you don't really think you got the opportunity to two putt from five feet. But, um, point is, is you always think about that moment. And, uh, and when it's actually happening, you, you know, you, you just, I, I want to say it, it almost felt like it happened so fast. Right. And I feel like a lot of people say that about, um, those kind of scenarios and, uh, you can't really try to enjoy it because it, it, it comes down, you, you have to finish it off on the last hole. You know, you don't have a 20 point lead with two minutes left. You get to, you know, jump up and down on the bench. Right. I mean, you, um, you've got to, you got to go till the last putt falls and then, and then soak it in. But you, here's the thing about you. You're very, you're, you're very in control of yourself, but your face does, like you're expressive a little bit. Like you have smirks, like you, like even when you're talking, like I'm, I'm, I'm with you back in 2015, walking up to the 18th hole. So you had to tell yourself that at some point during your, your master's journey in 2015, don't be emotive, don't show, even though you know you have it in the bag. That's pretty hilarious to me. Yeah, well, just on the last hole, right? Before that, like I was yeah. getting, I mean, these guys just wouldn't stop. And it just happens. Like they just yeah. wouldn't stop making putt shots. I mean, people were holding bunker shots. Guy I was playing with Justin Rose <laughs> was starting off with birdies. I'm like, dude, chill. You know, it's okay. Um, yeah, that's what you're kind of <laughs> thinking on the inside. And then, uh, you know, so it wasn't until it's really done and, and you're like, okay, I know, I know this is done now that um, you can let yourself uh, start to maybe wear it, just start to really think about embracing it versus, um, keeping your head down and, and it's never over till it's over kind of mentality. It would be quite an RV ride to the PJ if you won another one here in uh, 2023. And we wish that for you, of course. And the last time I had you on, we were taught, we were rating NFL players, golf swings, Matthew McConaughey came up and there was some discourse here. Listen, when, I, when you think about pairing up golfers, look no further than me. He said that he wanted to try to outspeed a nine iron instead of waiting on an eight. Let's hit a link sometimes. Has this happened yet, Jordan? No, I haven't. Uh, I, I think it's let's hit the links, but, um, but that's fine. If he only wants to play one hole, um, that works too. But uh, <laughs> uh, no, I, uh, I actually just was in Austin for a week, but um, we had a tournament, so I wasn't able to meet up. But um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been around him on the sidelines at Texas games and he's obviously taken a massive role there at the university and especially within the sports program. So, um, I mean, who's not a big fan of him? So, uh, it'd be, it'd be a bucket lister to play golf with Matthew McConaughey for sure. Okay. If that's true, I take, I mean, you, you know, you are, I'm sure visionary, you envision things. McConaughey definitely does manifestation, all of that. Let's make this easier for him. It's you, it's him. And then who's in the rest of the foursome? Let's give him a whole package to think about here. Who else is there? It seems like he was the one asking. So it'd be like, he, it'd be whoever he wants, which would be probably oh. cooler, probably cooler couple people than I could get. That's for sure. Um, that, you no. Know. Well, I mean, you, him, Bijan Robinson, and who? Bijan is the third. Man, he could probably kill the ball. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, let's, let's, uh, I'd probably go with Arch Manning just to, just to round oh. it out and, and say, hey, you know, Arch, Bijan, Bijan, and Matthew will give you some tips and on, on kind of the Texas culture there, and I'll, I'll help you out with your golf game. I love that. That's great. And if you need a caddy, I somehow got into a, a Google wormhole about your ca caddy and what caddies in your world make. And if you're looking for somebody, if he wants to take a vacation, I'll give you my application. I can drag a bag down a, down a, the links, if you will. Uh, I could do the that links. for you. Okay, you before go. we let you go and we 
Yeah, we are so appreciative of your time. Um, and we're very excited for you. But there's also exciting news with FanDuel, right? Because you partnered with FanDuel. You have your very own game, Jordan Speed's Fairway Frenzy. What's this <laughs> yeah. all about? How do we get in? Well, look at um, you. <laughs> yeah, look at that. Yeah, that's that's some fantastic posts there to make it make it look good. Um, yeah, just a normal golf game. You can shape it both ways. You get points from long drives close to the pin. Something kind of cool that FanDuel wanted to get going, and I was happy to partner with them on. We love it. You guys can check that out over at the FanDuel app, FanDuel.com, wherever you get your stuff, or on socials, of course, Jordan Speed. Good luck to you. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Go get it. Be the 18th. You said you didn't know the stat. 18th guy in history to win at Augusta twice and get that green jacket. Two of them. He's fast, Clemson. Clemson had their pro day two weeks ago. This guy absolutely balled out. And now we get to know him a little bit. We get to meet him, this tremendous linebacker who played three years at Clemson. He ran a, get this NFL fans, 4-4-3-40. He has a 40 and a half inch vert. Did I read that right? Trent Simpson, welcome to the show. Yes, ma'am, thanks for having me. Yeah, you're welcome, sir. Well, let's get, let's get going now that we are friends. I need to know a couple of things. Did you wake up feeling fast this morning? Tell me. I wake up feeling fast every day. That's just in me, but definitely this morning. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> this morning. Yes, ma'am. All right. What should I call you? Is it Trenton, Trent, T-Simp? The world needs to know. The NFL fans need to know. Uh, T-Simp is cool. I like that. But uh, if you want to just quick response, it's Trent. Trent is fine. Okay, well, you call me ma'am, so that's not cool. We're going to stop that. We'll work on that, though, <laughs> T-Sim. We'll work on that. Listen, your time at Clemson under under a, an incredible leadership team, all of that, it was really impressive. 166 total tackles, 12 and a half sacks, three forced fumbles. What was the most memorable moment, the one most memorable moment of your college career? Uh, I would definitely say uh, winning uh, the ACC championship my last year at Clemson um, against North Carolina. So I'm from North Carolina. Um, and just winning against the hometown state school that everybody thought I was going to go to. So uh, just accomplishing that with all my teammates. And, uh, and I had a really well game. Um, and just going out there and doing my thing and ending my career the right way. And um, being a champion, that, that felt so great because I know how much work I put in and how much my team has put in as well. 166 total tackles, 12 and a half sacks, three forced fumbles. That is woo, impressive. And your numbers are really impressive at the combine, too. You crushed it. You really did. Let's talk about the 40. You are the second fastest linebacker in your class, and you're tied for the seventh fastest all time at your position. Now, I know it's not just the cleats that give you this speed. How did you make sure you got in the 4 4 club? Uh, no, I trained. Um, I had went out to Dallas, Texas. Um... I had left after our last game and I had met with a coach, Brent Calloway, and uh, he's trained a lot of linebacks. He trained Devin White. So uh, Devin White ran 4-4-2 a couple years ago, um, LSU linebacker for the Bucks now. And um, I just trusted in him. Um, I went to work every day, put my head down and grinded. And um, I just know the type of work I put in. So when it was time to go out there on the combine, I knew I was going to put on a show and I was confident in every room I went in when I met with the teams that uh, I let them know, like, watch me because I'm, I'm going to have I'm put on a show for everybody and I'm going to do my thing. So went out there and performed well. Yes, ma'am. And you beat your goal, right? Your goal, I heard, was 449. Yes, ma'am. It was. It was. That adrenaline got to me, okay. though. Once I had got the line, the adrenaline, the hard work. Uh, and I felt like my technique was really well when I was running. So uh, once I heard 443, I was like, wow, like I really did it, you know. But uh, it's always been in me. I've always been super fast. So just to have it on official time and say I'm a 443 guy feels great. And I'm going to ride with that for the rest of my life. It's amazing. I go to I go to Dallas, Texas to party and uh, eat Tex-Mex. You go there to work on your speed and your athleticism, and it's amazing because, listen, there are some guys that have those qualities, the speed, the athleticism, but it doesn't translate to the field. You are not one of those guys. You fly around the field like an absolute maniac, if I can say so, and you lay the smack down on opposing ball carriers, and when they send you off uh, the edge onto a blitz. I got to tell you, it's like you're shot out of a cannon. And I yes, genuinely man. feel bad. I genuinely feel bad for any quarterback on the other side. So what would you say that your biggest strength is on the field? 
Uh, I would say definitely my um, spying the quarterback, uh, blitzing. I feel like when I'm moving full speed, um, that four four three translate on the field. Uh, every time I'm taking off and I'm moving at full speed, but I definitely blitzing. Uh, I feel like I have a great ability to understand angles, um, to tackle whoever has the ball, but really spying the quarterback um, and and really blitzing off the edge. Like I know when I blitz, I'm going for the script sack. You know, I'm always a turnover guy. Um, Want to be a playmaker at all times, so uh, that's definitely my my best attribute. These poor quarterbacks <laughs> in the NFL. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm them. excited. Yeah, I know you are. That smile. I think defensive coordinators are really excited too. Now you had your pro day with your teammates at Clemson. That was earlier this month, and after your combine performance. Uh, and all these numbers and all this incredible stuff that we're talking about, the 4-4 club and so on, do you feel like there's still something that you have to prove? Like, is there something that motivates you, like a chip on your shoulder moment? Uh, I would just say uh, still people just uh, questioning if I'm a first-round talent. Um, I I truly feel like um, when I talk to my parents, they always tell me control the things that I can control. And I truly feel like um, every opportunity I've displayed from the time I've left Clemson and – entered the NFL uh, world. I've ran four, four, three, jumped 40 inch vertical. And um, I can honestly say like, there's no other 235 guys, uh, 235 pound guys doing what I'm doing right now. And um, just my personality and going into these teams and um, interviewing very well, meeting with the head coaches, you know, the linebacker, defensive coordinator. I feel like I've controlled everything I completely can. So uh, I'm just excited to see where I'm going to go, but I know for sure I'm a first round talent all day. Yeah, I feel like I'm talking to a future absolute star in the NFL. I'm getting in on the ground level. And you better not forget me when you're an all pro or wearing a gold jacket someday because I was, you know, I was interested in you before you were even drafted. And you mentioned your parents there and they told you to control what you can control. Uh, And I read a really beautiful article talking about your relationship with your dad and how close you are with Sergeant Major Timothy D. Simpson. And we, of course, thank him for his 17 tours overseas and a service throughout these years. Just incredible. Can you explain a little bit what it's going to feel like when you hold up that jersey on draft night, whatever night, whatever place? I imagine knowing what I know that you feel like you're sort of accomplishing his dream too. Mm -hmm. Now it would mean a lot. Um, It's going to be surreal. Um, I'm not truly an emotional guy, but I feel like um, my name is called. It's not pour out of me because you know how much hard work and how much um sacrifice my family has made for me but especially my dad um him just trying to be a great role model for me and uh represent our country in the right uh, right way uh, means a lot to me but uh definitely getting drafted will be it will be Trent Simpson getting drafted but it's really for my whole family you know uh being a great role model for my whole family and just representing my last name the right way and uh just the way my parents have raised me um just truly blessed to have two supportive parents that have supported my dreams since day one and uh just when that name gets called, it's going to definitely all come out because I know how much work I put in and um, how much family I have behind me. Like, my support is amazing, you know? So uh, that's why when it's time to go out there and get in front of interviews or get on the field, like, I know, like, oh, confidence is through the roof because I know I got a lot of people back home cheering me on. I love it. I love that you already know you're going to cry. You already know you're gonna, it's going to pour all <laughs> out of you, and I hope you enjoy that and you deserve it. It's amazing. Uh, you mentioned your mom, too. So I saw that you were at the LSU game. Uh, I think with your mom and your grandma, right? So yes, shout ma'am. out, by the way, to those girls going to the Final Four. I heard that you're a big fan of women's sports. What was that night like to be there with two people and two women in your life and watching those women and cheering them on? Uh, it was a cool experience. Um, just um, I know My mom is a great basketball player, so uh, that's where I get a lot of my athletic ability from. My mom is mm. my height as well. My mom is a 5'10", great athlete, great mom. But uh, Whoa. just a lot of... Yeah, being able to take her and my grandma there to go watch uh, the LSU Tigers and um, really Angel Reese. They're really big fans of her. And um, I just knew, like, them being in Greenville and them being close, like, I wouldn't let that pass me by. So I got us tickets. Uh, we were really close. And uh, just to witness, witness those girls go out there and um, achieve their goals, it was amazing. I think everybody's had a great time. My mom was happy, smiling the whole time, took a lot of pictures. So uh, just enjoying everything, you know, uh, taking my platform and allowing it to um, – pass through my family. We all have a great time and make memories together. Gosh, Trenton, you're such a stud. You're going to be such a stud in the NFL. I cannot wait. And it's so great to meet you. Now, is there anything that you want teams, GMs, fan bases to know about you ahead of the draft? Like, What do you want people to know about you? Uh, I would want people to, the world to know that Trent Simpson is a relentless um, 
football player. I'm going to give it all I got. Um, I pride myself on uh, emptying the tank. Uh, that's my mindset whenever I play. Like, I'm going to give it all I got, you know. And after the game, um, when I give it all I got, it's always great for me and my team. But uh, I'm a great person as well. I'm going to come into the city and impact my community in a positive way. And um, as well, just be a great teammate. And I feel like um, I'm going to represent Trent Simpson like I've always has. And uh, whatever organization I step into, um, I look forward to bringing my winning pedigree to the team and um, continue to win championships. That's all I'm about. I've won at every level of football, so I uh, look forward to winning at the NFL level as well. Yeah, and you did it at a high level at Clemson. That's no joke. And when you were there, you played with Trevor Lawrence, as I understand it, as a freshman, right? Yes, ma'am. And you practice against him. But that can't be that fun because he's always wearing that dang purple jersey, right? You can never get your hands <laughs> on Trevor Lawrence in those practices or anything. Uh, let's say you're playing the Jaguars. Third down, your coach dials up a blitz. You're coming off the edge. You're unblocked. What is going through your mind knowing that you finally get to hit Trevor? Strip sack all day. Going for the ball and I'm getting him down. But it would feel great because, like you said, my freshman year, I was in young 18 year old and I was always getting close but you know you gotta stay away from uh, our quarterback but uh I'm definitely going for the script sack and I'll celebrate you know and after the game we'll we'll laugh and joke it up but that would be a great feeling for sure what can do do you can you do pick up anything off of his game can you you know he's having so much success maybe not right in the beginning in the NFL and there's a kind of a lesson in that too it didn't start great then he got new coaches now it's really they had, he had like the third greatest Come back in playoff history happened. He yeah. took that team back in the first half and did his thing, and then he went to Waffle House. Like, were you surprised when you see these great things happening for Trevor? No, Tre Trevor is, uh, like, um, besides, like, being the most amazing football player I've ever seen, like, the person he is, the teammate he was, um, like, that, all that stuff that the world is finally seeing about his football character, we all know he could do that. But uh, just the person mm. he is in the community in Jacksonville, like, that's who he was my whole freshman year. So uh, definitely not surprised. And um, I've seen a lot of things he's done at Clemson. It's like, man, wow, like, he's a great player. But uh, the person he is is truly amazing. And um, I know his career is going to just continue to keep getting better. And uh, it's cool to be a former teammate of his and just continue to support and watch from afar. Yeah. Trent, when you're when you're thinking about going to the NFL, and you I mean you said strip strip sack pretty fast, like you you were ready yeah. for that question and that answer with Trevor Lawrence. Who's the quarterback that you've sort of been like, man, I want to take him down someday in the NFL? Lamar Jackson, all day. It's like everybody seems Good to luck. get on Lamar. Yeah, they all seem to get up on Lamar, and it's just like he does something, and it is nobody can ever get him down. But um, I'm confident in myself, and I know for a fact that uh, I'm gonna get a sack on him one day, and we can roll this clip and uh. 21-year-old Trent Simpson is going to get Lamar Jackson down for sure. <laughs> you got it. I mean, I would say my answer for anyone else would be got to catch him first. Good luck. But you with this 4-4 <laughs> blazing speed, like Lamar's got to be on notice. Lamar should wait to figure out his contract situation to see where Trenton Simpson gets drafted and then get that out of that division, I think. And then he won't have to deal with you in that speed at all. I love it. You know, you're, you should, I would also say that you should be like a YouTube sensation, but you already are. You have this content going on, uh, which is inspiring, I think, and what a lot of younger players are going to start doing and should be doing. Um, is that, how passionate about that are you? Uh, it was definitely a passion of mine. Um, I feel like I have a pretty cool life. Like I'm truly living my dream. And um, I know it's kids worldwide that's living my dream. So just to give them a quick insight, um, especially like me coming up, like I always wondered what the combine process was, like what do players do to yeah. get ready for the combine. So uh, now I'm just taking my experience and um, having it all on documentary and allowing people to just display it on YouTube and allow them to just follow my career. And then for me personally, like, just myself, like, looking back to my first day in the life video I posted when I was getting ready for my sophomore year to, like, how far I've grown, the way I've changed, cut my hair. Like, just having everything documented and just being able to show my just my progress over time. I, I got to tell you, I have a, a producer on my show who came from a world where she did big features for Fox, like, the big ones you saw on Sunday, the John Madden documentary, all of that. And this morning on a morning meeting, she's like, the cameras he uses on these YouTube videos, like the quality of these videos is really, really impressed. She was going, you know, she's saying things, I don't know, I was talking about camera lenses and stuff, and I don't know what she was saying, but it was really impressive. And when I see that, I say, this is a kid who really sees something in that process, potentially in 
his NFL career and his college career and further and just that you are really leaning into that I thought was really cool so everybody should go subscribe to Trenton Simpson's YouTube page and YouTube channel right now sorry uh, and know that we're rooting for you do not forget me when you sack Lamar Jackson okay I would not <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get you in the first round. Nothing better. By the way, ESPN, if, the NFL Network, if you're hearing this right now, like, nothing better than a crier. If you guys want to cry, you got Trenton Simpson needs to go in that first <laughs> round so we can get the big lights, the big stage, the Goodell hug. I, how would you shake Goodell's hand? How would you dap him up? I don't even think, like, I would just give him a hug. Like, I would just be like, that's, that's really, I don't, like, I truly don't know what I'm going to do because it's going to be such a special moment. And, um, but I probably just give him a hug, man. Just tell him how blessed I am to be there. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I'm gonna try to hold my tears, but I'm just gonna be completely honest. Like I know when I look at my mom and my family, like that's when they'll start to roll down my face. But uh, I probably give him a hug and just let him know how blessed I am to be there for sure. Your family is really what matters here. Trenton Simpson, a terror coming to NFL quarterbacks everywhere. We appreciate you. We'll be right back at Up and Adams to wrap it up here on a Tuesday. So nice to meet him, and he's just gonna be a monster. He's going to rob me of all my fantasy points next year. I know it. Like, what isn't Tom Brady doing? He's acquiring ownership interests in the Vegas Aces. He's doing all sorts of stuff. And he still somehow has time to visit a spray tanner. Uh, it's incredible, the time management skills there. That's Rob Gronkowski. I need to see those photos again. They were posted during the show. This is, I believe, the Bahamas. Can I see those photos again, please? There we go. All right, so that's Blaine Gabbert on the left. It's our guy Gronk on the right, so we'll get the full lowdown on what this is. There's photos of Edelman. They're playing, they look, it looks like Top Gun out there. They're playing uh, football. Here's my question, Who's the, who brought the photographer on the vacation? Like who was like, you know what we need? We need a photographer to get this thirst trap action going on. Brady, available at Dick's Sporting Goods. What isn't he doing? The time management skills are off the charts. Comedy, ownership in women's basketball, like, Good for you, Tom. We love you. Swipe left.